The TI-99 foray computer is now 40 years old. That's pretty amazing. It was the first 16-bit home computer. And uh, in addition to being famous for the 16-bit CPU, it was also famous for being slow. It's time to fix it, and to that end I've been working on this board, which basically gives you a dual-core ARM Cortex CPU that plugs into the uh, cartridge port of the computer and enables us to do many interesting things. And here's a quick close-up of the board. As we can see, the board is relatively simple. There aren't too many components, all done in surface mount technology. The back side has a few passive components, but pretty much all of the action is happening on the front side. Let's then take a quick look at the components and main features of the board. We have the microcontroller, uh, then there's an external SPI flash memory of 16 megabytes, which can be used to store cartridge images and other stuff. There's a micro USB connector, which is connected to the microcontroller. Uh, this can be used to update the firmware of the microcontroller, but also to access the menus that are being provided by the firmware. And also one can upload a new cartridge images through the USB connection. There's an I2C connector here uh, that is used to drive a small OLED display. Uh, there are a couple of analog inputs which currently are not being used. Uh, there's an I2S uh, audio output and if uh, an external audio DAC is connected here, one can get a pretty high quality audio output from the board. Uh, and then there's a UART connection, which can also be used for many things including debugging. Then looking at the other components, we have a reset indicator. So that is a, a LED that's primarily used for testing. So when the MCU reset button is uh, pushed, this reset is lit. So that's useful to verify that the board is getting power. Uh, then there's another reset button in the other corner. So that's for the TI-994A. Uh, there's a status indicator, which is typically is just a flashing LED, letting everybody know that the, the uh, CPU is running properly. Uh, there's a menu up and menu down, which are used by the firmware. Uh, and then finally, there's a debug connector to debug the firmware of the MCU. Here the board is plugged into the computer, and uh, we can see that it's working as the LED is flashing. Let's run a quick co-processing demo. Before running the demo, uh, let me show where the demo came from. Uh, so it's from this basic program, um, I have been running this uh, in the past on many uh, home computers and on some emulators to get an idea on how quickly it can go. On the Sinclair QL we get a pretty good runtime, 3 minutes 39 seconds. That's very fast for this, or quite fast I should say, for this math program to render this in basic. I have also been running it uh, using uh, a ported version of Cortex Basic on the TI-99 4A. So that basically gives a pretty good runtime. So this basic is twice as fast as TI basic, which unfortunately cannot be used to run it due to the fact that uh, it doesn't support high resolution graphics. The Sinclair Spectrum when running this basic benchmark takes 18 minutes. Let's move over to the TI-99 4A and uh, we start here a cartridge image that I have created, uh, which is now running the same benchmark uh, using the strange card MCU processor and as we can see it's running pretty fast so the rendering is pretty much immediate and if we take a closer look on what actually is happening here on how fast this is going we can see that this actually is rendering it about 15 frames per second so this is totally on a different lens <laughs> different levels of speed than what we have seen uh, with the basic uh, implementations on the other computers and no wonder, because the uh, processor is so much faster. Let's take a closer look what happens inside. Here is a block diagram of the microcontroller. The one I'm using is um, from NXP, from Xperia. The model is LPC54114. And is, as is typical to many of these modern microcontrollers, there's quite a lot of stuff in this one as well. So uh, here uh, on the top left hand corner we can see the two CPU cores. What's kind of interesting about this particular chip is that this is a asymmetric configuration. So there's an M4 core which has a floating point unit and then there's an ARM Cortex M0 Plus. Both of these are being used in the standard operation of the Strange Card. In addition, what's kind of important here is that we have quite a lot of memory, uh, comparatively speaking here. So there's a 192 
kilobytes of RAM. And uh, then there's uh, a 256 kilobyte flash memory here as well. And uh, notably what happens is that uh, uh, one of these uh, interfaces here on the on the chip is an SPI port uh, actually here on the Flexcom ports and that is connected to a flash chip uh, which contains 16 megabytes of storage capacity and from there uh, we download uh, the ROM or GRAM contents into one of the memory blocks and uh, that enables the system to emulate a standard cartridge the cartridge port emulation is done so that the GPIO pins of the chip are interfaced to the memory bus of the cartridge connector. And then one of the cores, this one, the Cortex-M0, uh, is running a program I have labeled bus server. And what it's doing basically is that it's serving the requests coming from the TI-994A bus. And then it is uh, uh, emulating the appropriate memory type for whatever activity we have ongoing. So it could be RAM, it could be ROM, it could be GRAM. And all of that emulation is being handled by the software running on the chip. Let's look at normal cartridge emulation, which is, I think, the most normal use case here. So the board can optionally be equipped with a small OLED display. And if that is plugged in, uh, the board will detect it and it will show a simple menu there and using two push buttons one can browse and select which a cartridge to load. And simply by pushing these two buttons we can browse so we can take TI Invaders for instance and uh, like so we have TI Invaders running. So at the moment what's happening is that the board is emulating a standard cartridge uh, for the computer, uh, which means that it, it's emulating the memory features of the TI Invaders game. If I exit this one, I can go to the next one. We have Parsec, another classic game for the computer. And uh, again, uh, this should be working like that. So nothing uh, extraordinary working as usual. Uh, we can uh, do another reset there and uh, since the, uh, the game Car Wars, one of the, I presume, early games for the TI-99 for a and uh, with this game, what is notable here is that this game cartridge doesn't have regular ROM memory at all, it only has the GROM or the graphics ROM, which is a uh, sort of a unique TI-specific ROM memory type. Uh, also emulated by this board. Okay, if I exit here, uh, we can go forward. Uh, there's Defender uh, from Atari Soft. So here uh, we have another type of a cartridge, which is a room only cartridge. No graphics from there. Uh, I... So, uh, which is uh, a port of the basic form, the Powertran Cortex uh, by Stuart Connor, and uh, uh, it's using the Atecon mode of the uh, F18A graphics board inside of this computer and giving it the VGA capability. Right, so if we then do a reset there, we can move on to RXB to reach extended basic that's also supported. What is notable about this one is that it requires actually a GROM uh, memory support for uh, 8 kilobyte memories uh, instead of the regular 6 kilobytes, uh, which one would have in the legacy uh, original TI uh, supplied cartridges. So all of those things are being supported by this board. One of the unique things that this board can do is that if I now reset the computer, uh, you see that the texts have changed here. So if I go to the other page, uh, it's saying estranged. So uh, what's happening here is that the system console ROM memories for the graphics memory part are now replaced by the contents that this board is driving. So using this mechanism, uh, anybody can easily 
replace the console operating system for the JRAM part um, with whatever contents one wants.